you, Joel, and thank you, Trudy, for those prayers. Um, could you open your Bibles, uh, please, if you have them, to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And we're reading uh, today from verses 10 through to 17. 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 to 17. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let me just begin by praying again. Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together this morning. I pray, Father, as we look at the importance of your word and the role of Bible translation in your mission to the world. Father, I ask that you'll speak to each one of us of your love, your hope, how you want to shape and change each one of us, and your desire to draw people from across all the world to Jesus. Be with us, I pray, Father. Amen. It is... Great to be with you uh, today, this morning, this afternoon, as it probably is by now. Um, It's always great to visit a church, but it's particularly great to visit you today because you may not be aware, but this is a really special moment. Now, I've um, been hearing a lot today of the kind of changes um, that uh, you've been going through as a church over the past few years, how God's shown his faithfulness to KBC through COVID, through coming out of COVID, switching to two services. Now in your period of interregnum, the Lord's been faithful to you throughout. And I'm, I'm here to say really thank you because you have also been faithful and you have been faithful in a very particular way to a very particular people group called The Way in Cameroon. About 15 years ago, a conversation started between uh, this, this church um, and, and Wycliffe around how you might partner with a, a small team of Bible translators from the way. And since then, as a congregation, you have supported them year in, year out, ever since. And along the way, you have given, I checked this, more than £15,000 to this translation team. And even more importantly, I suspect that over that time you have prayed probably more than 15,000 prayers for this small people group. You've journeyed with them through some truly horrendous moments, uh, of which there'll be more later. And um, you've prayed for them and supported them, partnered with them through the comparatively straightforward task of negotiating that global pandemic. And now I'm the one that gets the amazing job of being able to come here today and tell you that they've done it. They have completed the translation of the New Testament. And as I speak, uh, we've got this nifty little app uh, back in in the office that tells you uh, where these New Testaments are. They are en route from the printers uh, in Southeast Asia. They are in the sea somewhere, or on a ship in the sea somewhere. Um, And uh, on the 10th of April, not long after Easter, they are scheduled to arrive in Cameroon. So thank you. As I say, there'll be much more uh, to come, but thank you. Because really, when, that mo- when those New Testaments arrive, that will be the moment when plans for the dedication of that New Testament start. And that 
heralds the start of a new period for the way church. Uh, when they and we pray that many more way will come to know Jesus through the Bible. Isn't that great? So yes, first and foremost, we are celebrating today that the way have the New Testament in their language. But it is easy, isn't it, for us to maybe overlook, miss for a second, just how incredible a moment that, that is. Because for those of us here who count English as our, our first language, and I'm aware, of course, there'll be many here who don't, but for those of us who, who do, we've been privileged to have the, the, the Bible in English for as long as uh, we can remember. In fact, this year, we're celebrating the 700th anniversary of the birth of John Wycliffe, the man who gave us the first English translation of the Bible. Looking around the room, I'm fairly confident, I think, that no one was around here at that time. But if we had been, if we'd been here in the 14th century, right now you'd be listening to me reading from the Bible in Latin. You probably wouldn't understand very much, if anything, of what I'm saying, but, but don't worry, neither would I. Our understanding of God would probably be very different. And John Wycliffe wasn't prepared to accept this. He didn't want there to be any barrier to people understanding the truth of the Bible. If we could bring the, um, the, the slides up, where there, there's, he had this amazing quote where he said, Believers should have the scripture in a language which they fully understand. It's amazing because for us in the 21st century, we would say, well, yes, of course, clearly. But back then, that was considered heresy. He set about leading the, the, the team that would translate the whole Bible from Latin into uh, the English of the time, Middle English. And it was considered such a terrible heresy that not only did he uh, endure all kinds of um, criticism and accusations at the time, Many years after his death, his bones were exhumed and burned along with his books, which just feels like overkill, really. 700 years on, we no longer consider having an English translation of the Bible as heresy. That is the good news. But maybe less good is that it's a whole lot easier for us now to take the extravagant abundance of translations that we have to choose from for granted. We don't get the joy that the way Christians are going to have at reading the Bible in their language for the very first time. We can afford to have half a dozen or so translations sitting on our shelves to dip in and out of as we wish. So this morning, as we, as we head towards this great passage in Timothy that we've just read, as we prepare to look at the unrivaled power of Scripture, I'd like you to do something for me, if you would. I'd like to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Shut out the distractions around us. And take a moment to reflect on this question. What role did the Bible play in you coming to know Jesus? Maybe you've been a Christian for a week, maybe 70 years or more. But what role did the Bible play? Now, let's do the same again, keeping our eyes closed. But this time, ask yourself this. Who would you be without the Bible? How would you be if the Bible wasn't part of your life? Thank you. Uh, whether you're here or joining us online, I hope those brief couple of moments helped you to reflect on the way that the Bible changes lives. It's changed my life. I'm sure it's changed yours. But not having the Bible is the reality for an awful lot of people. One in five people that's one in 1.5 billion people, do not have access to the Bible in the language that they understand best. They don't have that opportunity to be changed through his word. And these are all people that God longs to draw to him, just as he has you and me. 
He longs to shape their lives just as he has shaped my life and your life. That's why perhaps the Bible tells us itself how important it is again and again. And so today, as I said, I want to focus particularly on some of those powerful verses from 2 Timothy chapter 3 that we've just heard. To start with a little bit of background, this passage sits within a context of Paul's two letters to Timothy, who was a young leader in the church in Ephesus. At the time, he was a young leader who Paul knew himself intimately. He had personally trained Timothy. And Paul wrote these letters from prison in Rome to encourage Timothy to keep faithful to the gospel amidst all the false teaching that uh, were prevalent in Ephesus at that time. And this final part of chapter 3 is often summarized as Paul's final charge to Timothy. And you can hear, I think, how the extent to which Paul is urging Timothy to keep the faith and carry out his calling as a leader and as a preacher of the gospel in Ephesus. So it is very much a letter that was written particularly to Timothy, but it is also a challenge and an encouragement to all of us today. And one of the key messages that I think Paul wants to drum into Timothy, who is in the midst of all kinds of hardships and persecution, is that above all, whatever else, he needs to be and remain faithful to God's word, to realize its power and to lead others to do the same. And so with that in mind, I want to focus briefly on three uses or purposes that Paul notes that the Bible has which apply for us uh, us as much today as they did for Timothy and the church in Ephesus. And the first one is this, and it is probably the fundamental, most important one. The Bible teaches us about Jesus and about salvation through faith in him. As 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 says, You've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I love that phrase, wise for salvation. It's so simple, but it is absolutely true and essential. It, the Bible simply makes us wiser. It tells us things that we wouldn't and, and, and couldn't otherwise know or understand. Most importantly, it tells us of the significance of the cross. It's Palm Sunday today, isn't it? It's the start of Holy Week, the time of year when above any other we stop and we worship Jesus for his life, death, and resurrection. But as Paul explains to Timothy here, it's only because of the Bible that we're able to do that. It's because of the Bible that we're able to receive and understand the gospel, to understand that through him, Our sins can be forgiven, that we can have new, eternal life in him, and that we have the hope of Jesus returning. Without the Bible, we miss this incredible news. In fact, it's worse than that. People don't just miss it, they dismiss it. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's why uh, when you were thinking earlier about how you came to know or know about Jesus, while it, it may have been directly through reading the Bible or indirectly through someone telling you about Jesus, I'm pretty confident it wasn't too many steps back in that process that the availability of the Bible played a huge part in you coming to know Jesus. And that's why the work of Bible translation making the Bible available in the languages that people know and understand best, will always be a crucial and absolutely fundamental part of mission, of spreading this wisdom that Paul talks about, of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Wycliffe's vision is that in the same way, everyone can know Jesus through the Bible. We don't seek to translate the Bible for the sake of translating the Bible. We're not about seeing lots and lots of new shiny books sitting on lots and lots of dusty shelves, what would be the point of that? No, 
We do it because we want many, many more people to be able to know Jesus so that people can be wise for salvation. The second point that I think we can take from this passage today is that Paul tells us that the Bible is not only important for coming to faith, but also for growing in faith. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, possibly one of my all-time favorite verses in the whole Bible, says that all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does it mean to grow in our faith? Well, the Bible is vital for our development and growth as Christians. This is one of the central reasons we come to church each week, or it should be. I know it certainly is for you all here at KBC. To hear the Bible preached, to be challenged by it, to be changed by it. And yes, and also, I love this phrase, trained in righteousness and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And why is this so important? So that we, the servants of God, will be equipped for every good work, ready for whatever the Lord calls us to do. The whole of the Bible, from creation in Genesis through all the stories of the Old Testament, the good news about Jesus, the foretelling of the new creation to come in Revelation, all of it plays a part in, in shaping us and then continuously reshaping us into the people that God would have us be. There's so many of our brothers and sisters around the world who are Christians but yet don't yet have the Bible, who are crying out to have it for exactly the reasons that Paul articulates here. They want to be taught. Believe it or not, they want to be rebuked by, uh, by God through his word. They want to be corrected and trained in righteousness. And they know having the Bible is vital for that. Something we're asked about at Wycliffe from time to time is whether or not it might be better to deal with more immediate practical needs in a, in a community before embarking on a Bible translation. And it's a reasonable question, particularly when you, you consider that we're often uh, working with some of the most marginalized people groups on, on earth, often uh, communities living in extreme poverty, maybe communities who are dealing with the effects of war and other forms of of violence, and we give thanks for the really great Christian aid agencies uh, who are responding to some of those needs. But over the years, we've also seen the transformational impact that comes when a community receives the Bible, people come to faith, and then, as Paul describes here, they become thoroughly equipped for every good work. Communities scarred by endemic drug addiction are set free. Others deeply broken by the effects of war find healing themselves and then set out to care for others in pain. In fact, we've seen that among the way, a, a, a trauma healing workshop, a, a workshop that is rooted in scripture, uh, was used uh, to provide healing for, for some of the team who had been scarred in all kinds of ways by the, the horrible civil war that they've been caught up in. And they found it so healing and releasing that they went out and they repeated the workshop for others who all in turn also then found healing and release through that workshop. That is the power of Scripture. We shouldn't be surprised by this, should we? Because we know that is the power of God-breathed Scripture. Thirdly, my final point, Paul is also unflinching in this passage about the reality of the world we are living in. We don't need to watch our TV screens for very long at the moment, do we? Or, or read the newspapers, turn, have a look in our social media to see just how much injustice, evil doing, deception, suffering and persecution there is in the world today. As verses 12 to 13 tell us, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil and, uh, doers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. One of the things I 
love and particularly value about the Bible is that it never sugarcoats these realities, does it? It's honest about the reality of suffering and injustice and pain and heartache that there is and will always be in this world before Jesus comes again. That honesty is something that we have heard from translators working in incredibly difficult circumstances that really helps them when that suffering and persecution comes their way. And then it guides them about how to persevere through it. To give just one example, a translator in West Africa who is part of a a people group where where 96% uh, of of those people are Muslim, he told us that he has seen that where people have the Bible, they're more able to keep the faith when persecution inevitably comes. While people without God's word tend to struggle more. And he went on to explain that it's because he knew from passages like this one that we've, we've read today, to expect persecution. And then he had examples like Paul's to fall back on and follow when persecution came. The Bible speaks deeply into the reality of life in this broken world. And, but then it also gives us the hope, the hope that comes through Jesus, who will, as Revelation 21 tells us, make all things new, so that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Sometimes we really need that hope, don't we? But sometimes th- those words of hope and restoration can always almost seem too good to be true, almost impossible. And from a human perspective, in, in many ways they are. But God has given us the Bible to raise our sights up from the human level, to teach us things that we don't and can't know or understand, but that we need to learn, to make us wiser than we would be on our own, to tell us of things that our minds can't conceive or fully comprehend. And because we know, we know that the Bible is the word of God, we know it is true, whatever the world might say, we know, don't we, that the word of God is true then we can believe it when it tells us of this incredible hope that we have through Jesus. But for the Bible to have that impact on our lives, to make us wise for salvation, to train us in righteousness, to thoroughly equip us for every good work, to give us hope in the face of suffering, we each need to have it in the language that we know and understand best. We need the Bible in our language. And still today, so many people in the world don't have that. And until so recently, the way people of Cameroon didn't have it. And now they do. Now I know that because this uh, church has partnered with the way for for so long, some of you here may know more than I do about the way. But uh, for those of you who are perhaps newer to the church, just a little bit of background uh, to the way people. They're a small people group in northwest Cameroon. They rely mainly on subsistence uh, farming for their income. And their project to translate the New Testament into way started all the way back in 2007. And since then, the translation team is led by the, the guy you can see on, on the screen, um, Eugene. Uh, they have had to navigate some really incredibly difficult periods. In fact, I would say that the Bible translators uh, there are great examples of modern-day John Wycliffe's. They're so passionate, and they have been so passionate in their desire to bring the Bible to their, the Bible to their people in their own language, that time and again they have persevered in the face of ter- circumstances where most of us would probably have given up and gone and done something else. In 2016, civil war broke out in the region in which the way live. It's ongoing. Many were killed. Many more have had to flee their homes and villages. And while I was preparing for today, I, I was going back and leafing through some of the uh, reports uh, from, from back then and the years following. And it's harrowing to read sometimes. 
you'll, you'll come across a, a, a line that casually says that the meeting ended abruptly because of gunshots. Another time, there's simply a logistical note uh, saying that um, they, 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 they couldn't hold um, the, the meeting near this particular road um, at, at a given time. And, and you, you nearly go past it until you realize that the reason they couldn't do it was that this road was at the heart of the fighting at the time, and it was too dangerous to be anywhere close to it, let alone hold a project meeting there. At one point, uh, the, the translators left their families to relocate to a safer location so that they could gather together and continue to work. This was an incredibly hard decision for them, I'm, I'm sure, and unsurprisingly, the translators worried all the time about the families they left behind. At one point, we're told that Mr. Christopher has been away from his family and is always worried about how they are doing, especially when he hears that there has been an attack in the village. It makes it really difficult for him to really concentrate. Hardly surprising, uh, is it, when reports kept coming of more people being killed, more houses and homes being burned and looted. The translation project team themselves were directly affected. Some project staff lost both property and, tragically, loved ones. And how does the team respond through all of this? With a, a comment at one point that this violence and unrest has caused people to move further into the bushes, and this creates some difficulty in running scripture engagement and testing activities in the community. Isn't that incredible? Most of us would want to go, I think, into self-preservation mode at that time and just find a way to survive. But no, in the midst of all this loss and, and danger, the way translators were relentlessly pushing on with their work, and they were desperately trying to still get out into the community to make sure that it was as good as it possibly could be, that it would give glory to God when it was finished, and that it would be used powerfully by God for the transformation for, of the way people, and they weren't going to let the civil war stop that. That's far as, as I'm, that's why, as far as I'm concerned, and I, I'm sure you would agree, the way translation team are heroes, every single one of them. But they would be the first to say, first of all, they would be the first to give glory to God and give thanks for his faithfulness through, through this time. But then they would also say that they could not have done it without the partnership that you here and other Christians have shown throughout all of these moments. And so I'd like now just to pass on this message from Eugene, the, the lead translator. Now, I, I should say it's a, a recorded over, over Zoom. The internet quality is slightly dodgy, so apologies if the sound quality is not great, but we've, we've subtitled it for you. And I really wanted to to hear you to hear this message directly from Eugene. So if we could play the video, please. Thank you. We are so happy. We are so happy to, to get this information. And we say thank you. Thank you very much for, for being the brother that Jesus promised. I remember Jesus said that... Uh, when someone leaves family, father, mother, brother, and sister, in order to follow him, he will get many more brothers, sisters, mothers, and friends, and everything that they have left. Uh, this gesture tells us and tells me that I have a lot of brothers and sisters, though I don't know them, but I can feel their impact in my life and the life of our community. And I say thank you. The way translation teams stuck with it, they persevered. Eugene and his colleagues persevered. And they achieved their dream of a way New Testament. Because like us, they know that translation leads to transformation. But around the world... There is still so much more work to be done. One in five people still waiting for the Bible in the language that they know best. But the exciting news is that God is doing something we have never seen before. 
Quite simply, if we could bring the slides up again, that would be great. Bible translating, translation is accelerating at a quite unprecedented rate. We are seeing churches throw themselves into the work of Bible translation like they've never done before because they want to be trained in righteousness and equipped for every good work. And they understand that they need the Bible for that to happen. And the result is that there has been, and I'm not overstating this, an explosion of new work starting around the world. Got some stats um, to put up uh, for you. I won't go through all of them, but my personal favorite, new translation work is starting around the world at a rate of more than one a day now. In fact, I've, I've recently come back from meeting some of my colleagues over in the United States, and, and they've gone further. They have calculated that new work is starting every 17 hours, which is remarkably precise, but still very exciting. And remember, behind each one of those statistics are real people like Eugene, real communities who are hungry to be changed forever by the God-breathed power of the Word of God. We long for a world, world where everyone can have the opportunity to know Jesus through the Bible. And for the first time, we have hit a tipping point where that vision is actually in reach, praise God. There is now translation work ongoing in more than half of the world's 7,000 or so languages. And we want to keep up with this incredible pace that Bible translators, people like Eugene, the modern-day John Wycliffe's, are setting. We want to match their ambition. We feel we owe it to them. And if you do too, I'd love to invite you this morning to join uh, us and, and support, join these modern-day Wick, John Wycliffe's. And there's just a couple of ways that I'd suggest you could do that. First of all, all of us here can pray. I know there will have been people here who have been praying for the way for, for many years. Prayer is what makes the impossible possible. It sustains translators like Eugene through even the kinds of horrors that he and his colleagues had to face that they've endured over the past few years. So do, if you don't already receive it, do pick up a copy of our prayer diary uh, before you leave today. They're just out, out there. Uh, and sign up to receive future copies if you don't already get them. So we can pray. And then finally, I'd, I'd love to invite you to give. I know this is the moment when we normally shuffle our bottoms slightly uncomfortably. We talk about money in, in Britain, surely not. But I've got an amazing um, invitation for you, courtesy of a, a Wycliffe supporter who has really caught us by surprise, actually, and they, they have generously offered to, for, for anyone who signs up to become a regular giver um, today to double your first year of giving. Mm -hmm. whether, whether you, you sign up for £5 or £50, they'll, they'll double that for the first year. That means that your, your £10 gift will be £20 a month every, uh, every 12 months, or if you're a taxpayer and you can, you can give £25 a month, this time next year, that would be about uh, would be 750 pounds. And for every 20 people who, who were to cho choose to do that, that would, roughly speaking, cover the cost of translating the whole gospel of, Luke, of Mark into a language for the very first time. This isn't something we're able to, to offer online. Uh, so if you'd like uh, to take advantage of that opportunity, uh, the forms that you need, they look just a bit like... I don't have it with me. But they're out there, um, <laughs> as I will be too. You can find me uh, afterwards and, and fill it in, um, and we'll get that sorted for you. If we speak English as our first language, we are so blessed, aren't we, to have the Bible, not just in our own language, but in a hundred different versions. Let's not take that for granted. Let's be inspired by the example of John Wycliffe and Eugene and the many Bible translators around the world 
who are sometimes risking their lives, actually often risking their lives and their families' lives to have the Bible in their language. This Holy Week, let's go back to our own Bibles with fresh eyes. Let's go back with a renewed desire to spend time in it, learn from its wisdom, to get trained in righteousness, to be equipped for every good work. Can I close in prayer?